welcome back to another Days of Horror podcast. And I'm your host Chris, and today we're going to be discussing the Helmshaw train disaster of 1860. So Helmshaw is a small village that resides within the boundaries of the Rosendale Valley in Lancashire in the northwest of England. And according to the 2011 census records, an estimated 5,805 residents currently live there. The village has a history that goes as far back as the Neolithic period, with evidence still present today of human habitation as man-made stone implements and pathways are still being discovered to this very day. However, it was during the Industrial Revolution from the 1790s onwards that the village prospered as small mills were built along the river valleys, such as the Alden Valley, where there are ruins still easily visible. Helmshaw became a millworkers settlement during the 1800s, comprising of many woollen and cotton mills, as well as workers' cottages that were built throughout the valley and along the River Ogden. The Turner family were the first to establish mills during the 1790s, buying land in 1789 and building higher mill as a woollen fulling mill that was powered by two water wheels that would be replaced later by one that is still in existence today and is part of the now museum. In 1848 the area expanded with the laying of a railway line and with it came new buildings such as the Station Hotel and St Thomas's Church. Now one of the new mill owners who contributed to the expansion was William John Porritt who, for the time, he was known as one of the good employers as he was often arranged day trips to St Anne's just outside of Blackpool for all his employees. On one occasion he arranged a trip for his workers to witness the opening of St Anne's Pier using the trains from Helmshaw Station. With businesses now booming, a disaster occurred during the early hours of Tuesday the 4th of September 1860 that would rock the entire village. Having spent the previous day travelling to the Bellevue Gardens in Manchester, where over 20,000 people had attended to watch a brass band contest, several return trains had been appointed to bring people back home from New Bailey Station, Salford, from 11 o'clock in that evening. There were three trains in all, and these had staggered times of departure, with the first leaving at 10.50pm, the next at 11.10pm, with the final train leaving around 11.31pm. As an indication to how busy these trains were, the first consisted of one engine and 14 carriages carrying around 500 passengers. The second and third trains had two engines and 31 carriages, with each carriage containing between 30 to 40 passengers, with the majority being young and of mixed sexes. Now the first train, driven by WM Hoare, made its way into Helmshaw Station, and not long after carried on with its journey towards Accrington without any issues. It was between 12.30 and 12.40am when the second train driven by Thomas Seddon and William Landless would arrive at Helmshaw Station and within a few minutes tragedy would occur as the coupling on two of the carriages became detached due to the rebounding motion that occurs when a train is slowing down due to an incline and it pulls on the carriages in a kind of stop-start motion. This resulted in 15 of the carriages making their way back down the incline gaining speed in doing so. Meanwhile, the third train, driven by Samuel Ramsbottom and George Simpson, was around 400 yards from the station when disaster struck. It took approximately two minutes from the carriages breaking free from the station to hitting the approaching third train. For some passengers, it seemed they were quick to realise that something wasn't right, and before the carriages could pick up any speed, they tried to jump to safety. Now, some had been blocked by other passengers who perhaps thought they would be crazy to jump out of a moving carriage and others could not get the door so open on the side of the carriage due to them being locked. However, some did manage to flee to safety before the collision occurred. So, hurtling through the darkness and gaining momentum, the 15 carriages swooped down the incline and began to make their way around a sharp bend. The driver of the train stood no chance, unable to brake and certainly having no chance of getting out of the way. Impact was instantaneous as both of the carriages and trains smashed into each other. The passengers on the third train, unlike those in the carriages of the second, well, they were blissfully unaware of the impending danger to their lives. As the carriages slammed into the oncoming train, several of them were forced into a vertical position, and one finding its way over and onto the top of the engine. Four of the carriages were completely obliterated, safety valves were mangled, and the clack boxes were so badly damaged, steam and water rushed forwards, overpowering the unfortunate passengers of both trains with the shrieking noise of passengers piercing into the dark of the night. Now as you can imagine, this scene would have been one of utter destruction on a large scale. Pieces of smashed up carriages, metal components and mangled bodies littered the lines 
as well as the surrounding area with the grass fires lighting up the embankments. Trapped passengers were pinned down by iron and wood and the cries for the help could be heard permeating into the air. It was a clear night and with the light of the full moon along with the grass fires it helped aid the rescue of trapped passengers from the wreckage as residents of nearby properties came to help as best as they could under severe circumstances. It wouldn't take long either for medical help to arrive. Mr Harrison, a surgeon from the rail company making his way from Manchester by special engine. Now he was assisted by Mr Falshaw, Mr Parker, Mr Binns, Mr Aspinall and Mr Wright. The bodies of those who died that night were taken to a barn behind the Turner's Arms in Helm Shore and they were laid out onto the floor. The severely injured went into the Turner's Arms to be looked after, but as for the survivors, many of them eventually made their way back to their homes, but their lives would never be the same again, and you can understand why. Out of this disaster came tales of miracle survivors. Now, one being of a young girl, who in the last carriage was extracted after being trapped beneath an engine without so much of a scratch. But there's also the tale of a drunk who had been sleeping throughout the entire ordeal. Now, when he was found, and upon being woken, he jumped up and asked the railway official what they wanted stopping here. The official duly told him what had happened, and upon witnessing at first hand the carnage that had surrounded him, he thanked the official before going on his way again without so much of a scratch. As for survivors, one in particular by the name of Mr Thomas Robert Ashworth, a joiner who resided in Blackburn, who, when questioned at the subsequent hearing, he would tell that he remembered the train stopping for only a minute at Helmshaw Station, before he heard a snapping sound and that he then felt the carriage he was in was motioning backwards. So he loosened the door and started to mount the carriage in the hope of reaching the rear to where the brakes were. Now he remembered thinking that the speed was about 6 to 8 miles per hour by the time he was turning the brake lever. Whilst applying the brake he said he could see the third train approaching and he was knocked off the carriage from the impact hurting one knee as he hit the ground. So what went wrong and why did this terrible, terrible disaster occur. Well, the inquest into the disaster found that when the second train was nearly brought to a standstill at the Helmshaw station, the guards, as was the custom, released the brakes and the consequence was that the rebounding of the buffers caused the shackle and side chains to snap. Mr James Shaw, a passenger superintendent who was in the front portion of the train, felt something wasn't right and after jumping from the train, John Chippendale, one of the guards on duty that night came up and told him that the carriages were going back. Quickly he unlocked the first engine from the front and with Thomas Seddon, the driver of the first engine from the second train, they both took it onto the upline so they could proceed back down the line towards Ransbottom to stop the third train which they knew would be following from Salford. Now whilst their efforts may at first seem worthwhile, they would ultimately fail as they would be too late to intervene. So James had two objectives that night. One was to get in front of the runaway carriages and to manoeuvre them somehow onto the other line, thus avoiding the third train. The second objective was to stop the third train from actually hitting the carriages. Now on his way down he observed people on the line and that the detached train had come to a standstill. He called to his driver to hold on and as Thomas Seddon ran to the brake, James Shaw put the engine in reverse. As they were doing this, Thomas Seddon said he felt the engine go over something which he says turned out to be the top of a carriage, but he also said that when he looked up the line he could see nothing. What James Shaw and Thomas Seddon ran over that night wasn't the top of the carriages as he claimed, but in fact it was some of the passengers from the detached carriages as letters from witnesses would later go on to suggest. However, it seems that none of those who died that night were actually killed by James Shaw and Thomas Seddon as they made their way down the line, as Mr Grundy, a solicitor working on behalf of the Lancashire Railway Company stated, that he had five medical gentlemen present who examined the bodies of those killed and who all said that it was impossible that any of them could have been run over by the engine Shaw and Seddon took down the line. It would transpire that in total 10 people sadly died that night with another victim that would die 15 days later, making 11 in total. It is estimated that around 77 people were severely injured and needing treatment of some kind but this number could well be way above the 100 mark. Most, if not all of those injured, suffer from broken limbs, lacerations and bruising to their bodies. Many of the injured were taken into local residents' homes, where they could be looked after until they felt confident to make their way home. And whilst these lucky individuals may have survived the horrific events of that night, they would live with the sounds and images they witnessed for the remainder of their lives. 
Those that sadly died that night were Samuel Duckworth, aged 48. He suffered from a crushed skull and broken ribs. His son, also called Samuel, had managed to jump from the train, but his father unfortunately had barely climbed out of the window before the train struck. John Hartley, aged 25, suffered from both legs and arms being broken, wounds to his stomach and other serious injuries to his groin area. Richard Heap, aged 25, suffered from a compound fracture to his thigh, broken back and inward bleeding. Starker Harrison, aged 21, suffered from his right leg being broken in two places as well as being severely crushed. Mary Fell, aged 19, she was dreadfully crushed. Starkey and Margaret were engaged to be married. Mary Hayes, aged about 50, had a fractured skull and both legs broken and dreadfully crushed to the point of nearly being cut off. She was only identified by her clothing. Alice Hartley, aged 24, suffered from a fractured skull and two broken legs. Isabella Hindle, aged 21, suffered from a contusion to her brain. Thomas Lofthouse, aged 61. He suffered from a broken back and bruising to his stomach. Sadly, Thomas lay for some time under the debris. He was crying for help and water for the whole time. Then we had Thomas Blythe, aged 24. He suffered from an inward hemorrhage and a fracture to his skull. Finally, the last victim was Harry Butterfield, aged 20. He was taken to Manchester Infirmary with a compound fracture to the leg. He died 15 days after being admitted to hospital. So who or what was to blame? Well, that kind of gets lost in translation at first, as it seems that the verdict would cast doubt on whether or not human interference was to blame. After the initial inquest into the disaster, the jury would give a verdict of accidental death, saying it wasn't unusual for trains to be on the same line, on the same route, within minutes of each other, and that a quick turnaround is normal when there are large numbers of people waiting to use the rail service. As for the couplings and chains that hold the carriages, well, it seems highly probable that these may have been defective and not fit for use. However, William Cooper, the station master for New Bailey Station, Salford, remembers speaking to a porter named James Burke, asking if he had made sure the couplings and chains were right, with Burke replying that they were. Cooper also remembers telling the porters and guards on duty that night that to proceed with caution, as there would be around 2,500 passengers in three trains. And then there is the issue with John Chippendale, one of the guards who was working that night who had been drinking and enjoying the evening with the passengers on the second train. But when he got off the train at Helmshaw Station, he was found not guilty to the charges of neglect of duty, which would have made him chargeable for the disaster that ensued. The fact that Helmshaw Station was built on an incline gave the jury the opportunity to blame the layout over everything else, saying that it must have been known that if any of the carriages by accident ever became disconnected from the engine then they must inevitably roll backwards with a momentarily speed and so come into contact with any train that may be following them. Therefore this wasn't an imaginary scenario which could not have been foreseen. However what did come from the verdict was, and I quote, a grave responsibility will rest upon the directors not only of the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway but of all other railway companies who shall continue to neglect the simple precautions which have been pointed out. Henceforth, the recurrence of such frightful disasters as those as the Helmshaw and Round Oak stations will be inexcusable. The means of preventing the possibility of their recurrences are now well ascertained, and they are easily applied and inexpensive. Collisions occasioned by the backward rolling of carriages accidentally severed from the engine are now taken out of the category of mere accidents. They will henceforward imply such culpable neglect as will render those guilty of justly chargeable with a criminal offence. Helmshaw train station would continue operating until 1966 when it would finally close as part of the Beeching Act on the 5th of December 1966. Today a few remaining relics of the long lost railway line can still be found throughout the village. The signal box, whilst not looking as it once did back in 1860, has been renovated and brought back to life as a dwelling house. And just outside of the house, an original concrete lamp still exists today, just as it did over 100 years ago. The Turner's Arms Inn, where the bodies of those that died that night were taken to, has long been forgotten as the building was converted into a family home. Unfortunately, redevelopment of the village of Helmshaw has meant that all of the original railway lines have now vanished, and they have been replaced in some parts by public walkways and a bypass. The scene of the disaster is not easily accessible either, as private housing lies around the boundaries and with barbed wire fencing in situ, it makes access very difficult. 
You can just about see to some extent the area where the disaster took place, but time has been unforgiving as nature has reclaimed most, if not all, of the land that was once occupied by the lions. So thank you all very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this story and if you want more, please show some support and comment down below. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram, links are also down below, but in the meantime, take care and we'll be back soon with another story from the past.